Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. After last year's Oscars, what did I tweet out so stupidly, Brad? Oh, I remember this. This was good. We all remember the discourse online after the slap heard around the world. And it got to the point where it was a little overbearing, a little too frequent on Ryan's timeline to the point where Ryan had to go out and send a tweet. There better had not be an NHL prospect named Will Smith because I'm muting those words on my timeline. (laughs) Completely and utterly serious. Completely unaware that one of the top prospects for this year's draft is in fact named Chris Rock. There's also a Will Smith (laughs) in this draft. So Ryan's plan did not work out as he had intended. So anyways, today's prospect profile is Will Smith. I I'll be honest with you by that point last year, the, all I knew about this year was, you know, Bedard, Michkov, Fantilli. And I think Leo Carlson by then I had started to watch a little bit of, uh, but yeah, no, I did not make it to Will Smith and, and people gave me way too much credit. They thought, oh, Ryan's being funny because obviously Will Smith is one of the top prospects. And nope, Brad, you texted me. I think a little bit later, you were like, were you kidding or do do you not know? And I went, you have to be effing joking me right now. (laughs) And I'll tell you, my note, my, the words Will Smith, like that phrase, I think they're still muted on Twitter. I have to take that off now as we approach the draft. Yeah. Good old, good old Billy Smith. Can we change it to that? William Smith. I do. I, I've seen some people refer to him as William Smith. And so I, I might actually start doing that. I hope he goes by William. Yeah, you got to be careful or else uh, your timeline could just turn into the wild, wild west. <laughs> How many of those do you have queued up? How many? Yeah. Oh, there's going to have to be some men in black to come and take me out of here. Is there an I am legend joke in here? Not yet. I hadn't worked that one up. I'm still trying to figure out a way to work in Independence Day. We can do it. I believe it. I find a way. We'll, we'll get we'll get some references in here. Who are we as a second rate podcast if we can't ham fist some well, jokes in here? Really, it's a draft prospect profile. So this is our pursuit of happiness. Folks, welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. If you're still listening, thank you for, for bearing with us. Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk to you about all things Detroit Red Wings hockey, the world of the NHL, terrible, terrible, terrible puns, and draft prospects. I am one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I am the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And I'm Evan. <laughs> if I will fully understand if you want to leave right now. <laughs> I can leave? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> For legal reasons, I'm, I'm required to say no. I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> On this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we're going to be reviewing Detroit's uh, most recent game against Colorado, which uh, had a more happy storyline other than the you know one goal he scored in the 5-1 predictable loss, which was Simon Edvinson made his NHL debut. Uh, We're going to be taking a look at what these next few games mean for uh, the Red Wings in their reverse standings uh, chase as they not just look for a, um, a, a, you know, Red Wings chance in hell at winning the draft lottery, but also improving their draft position potentially. Uh, Antti Tuomisto was signed to an entry-level contract mere minutes ago, which was fantastic timing. So we'll take a look at him, where he fits in the pipeline, and why the Red Wings brought him on board for a two-year ELC uh, and then credit to the goaltenders, Sebastian Kosa and Carter Guylander have uh, had accolades of their own over the last little while, uh, both of whom who have, uh, have been pretty promising in the world of Red Wings goalie prospects. And then we'll be doing the uh, Will Smith prospect profile before getting into some other notes and news across the NHL. Before all that, some information for folks who uh, are attending or want to attend Winged Wheel Podcast Day at the LCA. We have been working closely with our friends at the Detroit Red Wings. We have more or less confirmed that the event is going to change uh, outside of the typical event protocol because, again, the game was moved to 1 p.m. So instead of doing our usual pregame event, attend the game and then do a postgame get-together, we are going to be doing the actual live recording of the episode is going to be postgame. And stay tuned for final confirmation on location. Uh, we are looking to have it actually in the Budweiser Beer Garden rather than Hockey Town Cafe just to make things a bit easier for you. Uh, but stay tuned on that one. If you have bought a ticket or if you will buy a ticket, and we are hoping to add more soon, 
Uh, we'll let you know via email as well. We'll announce it on the podcast. We'll put it on wingedwheelpodcast.com slash blog. So stay tuned for all of that. Again, Winged Wheel Podcast Day at the LCA, Saturday, April 8th versus the Pittsburgh Penguins. And if and when we do add more tickets, it's going to be at DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP. A portion of the proceeds from each ticket sold benefits the Jamie Daniels Foundation. So were you surprised to hear about a Simon Edvinson call-up at this point in the season? No, not even a little. I think we all had a feeling it was going to happen at some point this season. Um, you know, with the run of injuries uh, the team's had lately with Sherratt, you know, finally taking some time off for something apparently he's been dealing with for a bit. It made perfect sense that this would be the time because uh, it was under emergency conditions too, which, yep. you know, obviously is more of a paperwork thing than anything else in in this circumstance. But no, Edvinson had been playing great in the AHL. The Red Wings season, you know, not to be too harsh, is basically meaningless at this point. So one of the ways you can give it meaning is by giving a top prospect like Simon Edvinson a taste of what it's like in the NHL. Is it a little harsh putting his first NHL game against the defending Stanley Cup champions? Yeah, maybe. But if you're trying to get him acclimated to the NHL... It can't here, get any more difficult than this. So. Exactly. Here you go, kid. This is what you have to deal with to be successful in the NHL. This is the Stanley Cup standard. So uh, I think the timing made a lot of sense, especially with the the bit of a longer break before that game. And, you know, the rash of injuries and the way Simon himself had been playing. Every, everything seemed to line up that it almost made too much sense to not happen at this point. I was a little concerned. I was like, coming in against Colorado, a team who's... I think trying to make a statement, you know, based on the way their season started and and all the adversity they went through with their injuries and stuff, like this is a team that, yeah, they're in a a central division spot right now, but no, they could be a wild card team eventually. It doesn't matter really where it shakes out. They're they're looking to recover ground. They're fighting for that uh, higher divisional seed. They're fighting for home ice. That's probably the worst version of the Colorado Avalanche that you could face this year. So, yeah, that was going to be a tall task for Edmondson. And I think he said uh, on the Bally Sports broadcast, happy belated birthday to Ken Daniels, by the way. Uh, They said on the broadcast, Edmondson could hardly sleep. He was so nervous. And I thought about that. I was like, if your first game is against, like, Columbus, of course, it's your first career NHL game. You're going to be nervous no matter what. But against Nathan McKinnon, Kale McCarr, a team full of guys who all have Stanley Cup rings, like, yeah, that's a lot. And I think he did well. I thought he looked actually pretty good, uh, all things considered, from what you guys just mentioned. Like, he was aggressive on the puck. He looked confident. And the fact that you can do either of those two things against Colorado is a huge win. Oh, and he was playing with Robert Haig. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And he, he wasn't going to come in and play with Mo Sider day one. Um, you want to shelter his minutes. You don't give him too much. You, don't, you, you kind of control who he's exposed to offensively. But, yeah, you're playing with Robert Haig. And not to rip on Haig for no reason, but... He's not going to elevate you as a defensive partner. Right. Um, it was not too far into the game at all where Edmondson really kind of shone, in, not in massive ways, but uh, in ways where you're like, those are just simple, solid plays, very much like a bring it home kind of game. Just go out there, do the basic fundamentals. Don't overstretch yourself and, and just focus on the little things. Uh, stepped into Nathan McKinnon, who was trying for a break in, which like, Nathan McKinnon streaking down the right side of the puck. There's a really high chance he's going to burn you. Doesn't matter what your name is. And he is. did. To, well, not not to Simon Edmondson, but to other players on the Red Wings. He did. Yep. <laughs> yes. And Edmondson used his big body, stepped into McKinnon, and you know hit him pretty heavily uh, along the boards. And then I think by the end of the first period, he had uh, zone entries, very cider esque denial of zone entries for McKinnon and Kale McCarr. Uh, and then he there, there was a really good stretch pass. I think it was to Adam Ernie and a bunch of little plays like that where you're like, this is a better version of Simon Edmondson. Surprise, surprise. Than we saw in in you know maybe development camp and and pre earlier in his development process. He's smart with his stick. He's using his length. He's using his size. I thought the tripping call on him was a little weak. Uh, all in all, a fundamentally sound game from Edmondson. It was really really promising to see. Yeah. If you're going in against Colorado, you're hoping you can just hang on. Like that that is a successful debut in those circumstances. And the fact that he looked good, I wouldn't say he did a ton of things that that were special, but I don't think anybody was expecting him to. And I think the team was probably specifically asking him, Hey, 
This is not the game to be taking chances. And you, you could tell he got more comfortable as the game went on because even in the first period, they really sheltered him. He only played four minutes and something in the first. And then they started giving him a bit more of a regular shift. And as the game got out of hand uh, and they were just rolling lines, he was getting out there a bit more. And there was one play, too. You, uh, It ended up in a really nice save by Georgiev, but I forget which Red Wing had the puck in the corner. And Edmonds, and he fired it to the middle of the ice. And who was walking into the high slot? Perfect time to pick up the pass, but Simon Edmondson. And he learned that if you snap a puck from their high glove unscreened on an NHL goalie, it's not going in. Yep. But... Hey, it was a, a great play to find the space, find the seam, maybe next time shoot for a rebound. And, you know, it, it's those little things that as he gets more comfortable, we're going to see more of. So the fact he was already trying it, game one is probably a really good sign. 15 minutes, I, I, as a defenseman, but 15 minutes against the Colorado Avalanche in your NHL debut, that's good. That's, that's, a, that's really good. Yeah. Uh, again. Anything to write home about? No, like Brad said, there wasn't any kind of fantastical play that is going to make the NHL play of the week highlight reel or anything like that. But hey, if you have a few key highlights that are worth clipping and posting to say, hey, here here are things that Simon Edmondson has done really well today against two of the best players on the planet. That is, by Red Wing standards and any rookie standards, really, really, really good. So uh, some people joked and they were like, I would take Simon Edmondson over X player on the Red Wings right now. And I don't think a lot of them were wrong to say that. You, I, I, I appreciate and I agree with the Red Wings' plan to keep him down this year as long as they did, and he'll. I think he's probably going to go back. Uh, but Simon Edvinson is really well poised to not just step into the lineup next year, but step into to the lineup with confidence where even if he starts as a third-pairing defenseman, a lot can change, but I think he's going to have a much bigger role by this time next next season understanding that he will have a lot more consistency issues than some of the veteran players around him in the lineup, but also understanding what his skill set is and what his his highs will look like um, relative to his lows. And factoring in what we've seen in only one game, he's probably the fourth or fifth def- defenseman in this organization right now as we speak. And that's a good advantage to keeping him in Grand Rapids where he can develop because, you know, someone said something, we'll talk about Kosa later, but they said, why don't we bring Kosa up right now? And like for the same reason you didn't bring Simon Edmondson up way sooner than he he needed to be, you don't want to burn a guy. Like give him time to really develop and solidify so that when he does step in, Brad isn't insane for saying things like he is, you know, fourth or fifth ranked defenseman in the organization right now. We've seen what torch and confidence can do to prospects, and I, I very much appreciate the way it's kind of gone for Edmondson. He's a, it's not right to call him a project pick, but he has a lot, a lot of tools that needed an equivalent amount of refining. Like he wasn't drafted as an NHL ready prospect, so this is going to be the path for him. Well, he was the biggest talking point in preseason, and and almost none of it was for good reasons. He was plainly bad. In the preseason. Mm-hmm. So the fact that his game has progressed this much in what's it been six, seven months? It's tremendous. Yep. And it's like this is a normal development path for a good prospect. It's been weird because the Red Wings had, you know, no high end prospects for so long because of just they never drafted that high. And then they had Zadina, who is anomalous. I think just the way his his draft stuff, like where he was drafted compared to where he is, that's a bust. And then they had Cider and Raymond who were like shattered through expectations immediately like NHL All-Stars. So that middle ground is almost kind of an unknown for the Red Wings. But now you have Edmondson and Casper and et cetera, et cetera. He played one game, even though it was under emergency conditions, it still does count towards his, you know, uh, nine or fewer games before you burn a year of his contract. What do you think the Red Wings are going to do here? I think that's going to be up to Simon. Uh, if he's playing well, I could see him playing 15 games. I could see him just sticking for the rest of the season because traditional thinking is kind of going by the wayside with ELCs because some teams, and we've seen the Avs do this with McCarr, and I think Vancouver did the same thing with Quinn Hughes, where they wanted to get these guys out of their ELCs super quickly in, in two years because they wanted – to get their second contract a lot cheaper because if you have three full years of 
uh, uh, sample size, those players can demand more money. Whereas if you only have two, but you're positive that this guy's going to be a star, that's less bargaining power for them. Therefore, you can get them a little cheaper. So I'm not saying that with Edvinson that's going to happen because obviously Edvinson is not Makar. <laughs> But I don't think that nine games is as big a deal as it used to be in the NHL. If the Red Wings are super confident that Simon Evanson is going to be a player, I I don't think that nine games means a damn thing to them. Yeah, I the injury, like if everyone gets healthy, I think that'll push Edvinson out more than anything. But um, yeah, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that he'll be sent down. I yeah. think you're right there. I, I think the... I should say, I think the most likely scenario is he is probably back in Grand Rapids before the nine games. Yeah. But if he plays well and he is, you know, I won't say holding water. I'll say thriving at the NHL level. They will keep him at the NHL level till the end of the season. But if he's showing flashes of maybe not being ready or, you know, he's just kind of a guy out there, even if he's doing well. If he has nine games like he did against Colorado, as happy as we are, he's going back to Grand Rapids. Yeah. yeah. So, but if he has a few games where it's like, okay, okay, now we're seeing him play with some confidence. He's making some plays. He's having a really positive impact at both ends of the ice. I, I would think that then shifts the uh, plan to he's just going to finish this season as a Red Wing. So that's the the Red Wings. They ended up losing that game 5-1, all that positive talk, and they got torched because obviously it's the Colorado Avalanche, and we are post-selling at the trade deadline Detroit Red Wings, and these games are getting a little bit tough to watch. But Well, between injuries and trades, they're down, what, six players from a month ago? Yeah, Zadina took a reverse hit in practice and got shaken up, still played the game. Sherratt was out, like you said, he was dealing with a lot. There was a lot going on for the Red Wings. Yeah, where... Fabry's still out, Rasmussen's still out, no more Bertuzzi, Sunkist, Brana, Heronic. This is a different team. Yeah. It, it sucks to say, but if anybody's worried about, oh, we looked so good up until the trade deadline this year, and now this team's awful, well, yeah, you you lost a, almost a line and a half worth of players. <laughs> you have Pew Suter playing on your top line, which, hey, I am all here. Hey, he for... scored on an absolute snipe, Ryan. I am not going to take any Pew Shooter slander here. You do not need to tell me that Pew Suter deserves more credit. Yeah, good rip by Suter. Larkin got on the assist there, and that's all the Red Wings did for scoring. Their upcoming games, they have uh, St. Louis or Florida on Monday night at the LCA and St. Louis on Tuesday. We'll be back with you for another episode on Wednesday, but right after that is St. Louis again. And those are three very important games. Because here's the Why, thing. Why, Ryan? The toilet bowl? <laughs> well, here, for different reasons. First of all, Florida is going for a wild card spot. And the Red Wings will want to hope right now that they are going to knock the New York Islanders out of that wild card spot. Because you are either of the mind that you're trying to maximize this year's Islanders pick to as high as 13th overall. Or they are so bad, it, it triggers that top 12 protection and it slides to 2024. And then fingers crossed that the Islanders are even worse next year, and it's an unprotected first round pick. Currently, the the Islanders are in the first wild card spot with Pittsburgh behind them and Florida behind them. Florida does have the games in hand to potentially pass them, though. So there, you would want Florida if you're full tank here. You would want Florida to win to put pressure on the Islanders. So what you're saying, it Ryan? These are the most important three games to lose in a long time. Um. Say it, Ryan. Say it. You're you're trying to be very political. No, about no, it. I don't think so. I don't think I don't think it's gonna move the needle that much. But what I will say is right now in the reverse lottery standings or the reverse standings uh for the Bedard lottery, St. Louis is right ahead of Detroit. Two two wins ahead of Detroit? They are Detroit is exactly four points, two regulation wins ahead of them, same games played. If St. Louis wins both of these against Detroit, Detroit moves down another spot in the overall standings and has just that little bit more chance at Connor Bedard. But I think more reasonably here, they get a better pick and a very, very good draft at the top end. So I'm not going to sit here and root for Red Wings losses. That's not what I like to do. Like three and a half percent to five percent for Connor Bedard. Uh, yeah, right? Like, okay, whatever. Congrats on the change in your pocket. Hey, I'm sitting here waiting for the drip to come out of the tap. <laughs> Anyways, St. Louis wins these two. Detroit gets a little bit of a buffer 
uh, on against Washington, Buffalo, Ottawa behind them, who are doing their best to lose plenty. And, you know, they get a better pick. You have no idea how excited I am to stop doing this every year. Well, Brad. It's our fault, really. But you know what we helps did with this. that? Yeah, yeah, we sold Bertuzzi and Hronik and But you know what helps with that? Not doing this every year? Connor Bedard. That's right. Or William Smith. Good old Billy Smith. <laughs> we really need him to do that. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the hitch of it all. So right now the Red Wings are 10th in that order. 11th keeps them in the Bedard lottery. 10th is just a, a spot better. We're talking about potentially ninth here, so not a lot. But uh, I'm just going to run the tankathon once. Nothing happened. It was St. Louis. Was it? Oh, my God, it was St. Louis. That could be us. That could be us. That's why it's important <laughs> to lose those games. Anyhow, that's the Red Wings' upcoming games. That's where they are right now. Hey, the Red Wings for a week now have been stuck at 69 points. Wow. That's not the right answer. It, the answer is nice, and I was trying to think of something to add to be perverse, but uh, we'll just keep going. <laughs> it's Sunday. Let's talk about some Red Wings news that happened right before this episode. Uh, Antti Tuomisto was signed to a two-year entry-level contract just mere moments before we hit record. Uh, Tuomisto was drafted in the second round of the Mo Sider 2019 draft. He was the... That was the last draft of the uh, Tyler Wright era of the Red Wings uh, amateur scouting and uh, has been a little bit of a uh, a process. He's not really lived up to his second round potential thus far. Like, don't pigeonhole the guy quite yet, uh, but hasn't been blowing the roof off the place, so to speak. So uh, where is Antti Tuomisto now? What does his contract signing mean? What has he done to date? He was that rare case of getting drafted out of the Finnish Junior League and then continued to play in the Finnish Junior League in his draft plus one year because he did not want to lose his NCAA eligibility. And his draft plus one year in Finland, he absolutely torched that Finnish Junior League, which was a great start. And then he got to the University of Denver and um, won a national championship with him in his second season. Was overall pretty underwhelming in the NCAA. Showed flashes, but an entirely forgettable NCAA career and then went back, like left the NCAA early to go play pro hockey in Finland after, you know, spending the extra year in junior to avoid that and is having again, another pretty unremarkable year, 20 points in 60 games for an offensive defenseman. So I I hadn't written him off completely, but he definitely moved way down my priority chart in terms of, you know, my Red Wings prospects rankings, guys to keep a focus on. You know, when you're building out the depth charts, you almost forget to add him at points. But he is a six foot five right handed shooting defenseman who has showed flashes of very high offensive upside. So he's definitely worth keeping around on the hope he puts it all together. Because much like William Wallander, he was definitely a project pick when he was drafted. Nobody said this guy was a surefire star. Nobody said he's definitely going to put it all together. And I guess him and Wallander to this point are kind of the perfect dichotomy of both ends of the, the spectrum of when you have a project pick. Wallander's putting it all together really, relatively quickly. Tuomisto is not. So I am glad that his rights aren't going to expire at the end of the year because, again, he's a six foot five right right-handed shooting defenseman with offensive upside. If he ever puts it together, there's something very intriguing there. But he's also 22 at this point, so we're getting close to the point of, yeah, but is he going to? But the lack of right-handed D in the organization kind of necessitated it, so you might as well at this point. Yeah, like we've mentioned in previous episodes, and as you just noted, Brad, the Red Wings are thin in at their right-handed D department. So thin to the point where it's Tuomisto, Plandowski, and that's pretty much it. Uh, I'm almost positive that they're, they're going to address that somewhat in this upcoming draft, but you need something else in your pipeline. I think there are going to be more solutions by way of free agency and, and potentially trades, but this is what the Red Wings are working with. So I do think that worked in Tomiso's favor. This was a two-year ELC, which, you know, that can be explained a little bit by what Brad just said in terms of performance and the fact that he is already 22. So you're not working with like a, you know, 18-year-old's timeline here. So 
yeah, it, I think f- this is uh, probably not to make not something to make too much uh, of a mountain of, if that makes sense. Like it's not nothing. Tuomiso has an opportunity here. Who knows? Maybe when he comes over, uh, he can stick in North America. He he really breaks through, and then all of a sudden, the project just kind of comes together really late. We've seen that happen with defensemen quite a bit. If anything, it's just organizational depth at a position of need, and he has the tools to at least keep things interesting. Yeah, it's a supply and demand thing, really. Like you, you can't let a guy like that walk because you don't have anything else to fill the pipeline with. So until that gets addressed, it's a two-year stopgap at the absolute worst. So that's Tomisto again. It, it almost necessary, but uh, I mean, I am curious to see who he's joined by. Uh, after this upcoming draft in terms of right-handed D, because it really is just another poignant example of the Red Wings don't have much there. Uh, after We we mentioned this in previous episodes too, but Eisman has noted he doesn't like playing defensemen on the wrong sides. People have pointed out oftentimes, they're like, well, these wingers often play on the wrong sides. Like, yeah, that's different. That has advantages in terms of shooting. Like, you don't have so much responsibility to pick up the puck along the boards uh, to keep the zone like defensemen do. There's just it's just a little bit of a different game. I don't know if Brad, as a forward, you would agree with that. It's more difficult to play your off wing as a winger, but definitely easier than playing your offside on the D. Because if you just think of isolate one play, if there's a right side defenseman making a breakout pass to a left winger, but the right side D shoots left and the winger shoots right, the winger is going to have a way easier time catching that pass on his backhand then that defenseman is going to be able to either A, send that pass on his backhand or turn his body under pressure to make that pass on his forehand. Yeah. More on Red Wings prospects here. One who has been the subject of a lot of attention uh, and concern, I think justifiably on both ends, but more more recently has been uh, really, really strong, has been Sebastian Kosa. He's in the ECHL right now with the Toledo Walleye, who are, I believe, on an 18-game winning streak. In that 18-game winning streak, Sebastian Kosa has won 10 straight games. 10 straight games, and in that time, he has a 965 save percentage. We talked about this last episode, because obviously this winning streak has been running for, for quite some time. Uh, but Brad, you said something that I thought was really interesting and, and I think is true in that, yeah, it's important for Kosa to have big performances. Put up a shutout, put up a big upset win once in a while, uh, stand on your head for the team. But for a guy who is, you know, was drafted based on athletic ability, his potential based on his raw skill, maybe not so much red NHL readiness, that consistency is what's going to help hone his craft. Really, not too dissimilar from a lot of the conversations we've had around Simon Edvinson. Obviously, it's not one-to-one between defensemen and goalies. It's practically two different sports. But it's good. It's really good for Kosa to have this kind of stretch of consistent winning Understanding what it's like to backstop. Yes, the team is very strong and that's going to make your life easier. But a 965 save percentage over 10 games where you're 10-0-0, that's, you have to think Steve Eisenman and company are thrilled with that. Goalie's such a mental position that this winning streak alone should really, really help him out in this offseason, no matter how the rest of the season goes, just because now he knows he can do it at a high level for a long uh, for a prolonged period of time mm-hmm. there's even cuz he probably has those had those thoughts going into the season like man I really hope I can string this together now he's a pretty confident kid so he's like I got to string this together at some point and for the first couple months of the season he wasn't so now that he is and you know I don't know how many games it takes how many weeks it takes the ECHL to play 10 games, but for, let's say, you know, three, four weeks, he's keeping up this level of performance. That That is something he can carry with him all summer so he can, you know, come into next season in Grand Rapids with some confidence and go, okay, I'm the guy here. I can do it. It's the same thing, just a little better. Like, just that reassurance over and over and over again, like, yes, yes, I have this. Someone asked, you know, what's the, how does this adjust Kosa's path? What does the timeline look like? How much time will he need in the AHL? And all I can stress on that front is there's no way to know. Yes, you want, want to know, need to see Kosa in the AHL in a consistent position, playing a good chunk of games next season, no matter what, anything less than that. And if some alarm bells are ringing, I think, 
uh, you know, you're not throwing in the towel, but you need to see Kosa stick at that next level pretty consistently. I don't disagree with the move to to put him in the ECHL because that's where he's going to get games and playing time and build that consistency, but you're going to need to move up. The first step is just making that team. I don't think we can sit here and say, oh, Kosa will be ready now in two and a half seasons for the Red Wings, and that's when Huso will blah, blah, blah. Not, it is so, things can say, change on a dime for goaltenders. We're ta- we're about to talk uh, about a goalie that the Red Wings drafted in the seventh round after we're done talking about Kosa. Like, it is such a wild position to project, draft, develop, stay consistent. It is absolutely, in my mind, unreasonable unless you're Mark Andre Fleury level drafted goalie to say yes, this goalie will be ready on this date. That said, that doesn't remove the heavy weight of where Kosa was drafted from expectation. So if folks are saying, you know, if I don't see Kosa in three years and at least fighting for a spot in the winged wheel, then I'm disappointed. I don't blame anyone for saying that. That's yeah. that's the gambit that Eisman took when he traded up and and took Kosa with that uh, with that mid first round pick. That was a lot of draft capital, and that's what he needs to do. But yeah, as far as what you can reasonably expect from Costa right now, just hope that the next step is as strong as this one has been with some uh, smoothing out of the edges over the start of the season. Yeah, like he's doing everything within his power right now to move on to the next level and, and to con- continue his, his development. So, I mean, you can't put timelines on goalies. Everybody knows that. But, I mean, right now, how could you be disappointed in his performances? So that's Sebastian Kosa. We just finished talking about a, a mid-first round pick. Let's talk about a goalie prospect who was taken in the seventh round. Same draft as Antti Tuomisto, funny enough, 2019. 191st overall, Detroit's final pick in that draft. Carter Guylander out of the AJHL. Uh, one of their more under-the-radar goaltending prospects. We've brought him up a couple times on the show, but again, if you're drafted out of the AJHL, seventh round, it's it's going to be a little bit more of a project path for you, but he has been quietly outstanding especially of late his third season with um colgate just backstopped that team to the ecac championship uh it was a couple of really really strong performances uh one against uh quinnipiac and uh, against harvard in the championship game stopped 40 of 41 against quinnipiac and 34 of 36 against harvard was named the most outstanding player of the tournament and obviously was on the uh, was named as the goaltender for the ECAC tournament team. This is a guy who can make some noise in terms of uh, the Red Wings goaltending prospects, and one that deserves a lot more attention now. And he's going to get a lot more attention because just moments ago we found out that they're going to be playing Michigan in the Frozen Four, Colgate. So uh, a lot more of a closer view for Red Wings fans. Yeah, uh, no better team to put him up against to see what he's made of than uh, Michigan, who I think got the number one seed. Uh, for this tournament so uh, it's it's a tremendous development because you know we talk about how anything past the third round you're just taking a flyer on something and hoping that you know something sticks to the wall so taking a six foot four six foot five goalie playing in a junior a league in canada in the seventh round is your definition of all right, it's a long shot. Maybe there's something here. So you're kind of betting on his his size a little bit there with obviously whatever talent they saw at the time. And then, you know, he's I think he split time his first two years in Colgate because he wasn't playing the full season. I think he was getting around 20 games a year and was okay. He definitely looked like he belonged at the NCAA. So, you know, when you have a kid jumping from Canadian Junior A to the NCAA and, and um, holding his own, it's a good sign. And then, yeah, this year he was the definitive starter uh, put up, I think, a 918 save percentage mm-hmm. this season, and then goes out in the most important tournament of his life and puts up the most impressive performance of his life. Um, which, again, we talk about how much of a mental game goaltending is. If you can keep your performance going at, on that stage, that's a really, really good sign. So, you know, that 2019 draft for the Red Wings was flyer. They took a lot of flyers and some guys, and they could walk away from that draft with Cider. Uh, Tuomisto, Johansson, Soderblom, <laughs> Kylander. Yeah, quietly, that a could, really strong draft. A really, really good draft for them. Could be. Could be. You know, only one of them has played, two of them have played in the NHL to this point. So still a lot to be worked out there, but um, turning into a very positive draft. And there's a reality here where the Red Wings goaltending tandem for 10 years is Kosa Guylander, which would be a really, really fun 
uh, dichotomy of the first round pick and the seventh round pick both working out. And I would love that. That that would be so much fun. And you know they're both big, tall, athletic goalies. So <laughs> why not? It, it it would be what like seventeen feet of goaltender between the two of them. <laughs> It is the ultimate demonstration that goalies are voodoo, and we do not know enough about them yet in terms of both the drafting and development. So don't be, I don't want to say don't be mad when they, uh, when you spend a really high pick on a goalie, but especially don't be mad when you use depth picks for them because they can turn out to be quite good. And they're like, Guylander is not the only name that was drafted late who's making uh, noise in terms of uh, goaltenders across the NHL. Either. In, in that same round, Calgary took Dustin Wolf. Yeah. Who is <laughs> absolutely lighting it up right now. Yeah. A lot of teams I know have subscribed to the theory that you need to take a goalie almost every single draft because 90% of them aren't going to pan out. But if you can hit one in the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round, that sets up your team for the next 10 years. So it, it's worth it. Um, I, I usually subscribe to that theory. And, you know, the Red Wings have had a lot of misses lately. A lot of misses. So Kosa was the swing for, all right, we're hoping for maybe a little more certainty here. And all of a sudden, Guy Lander hits. There's... There's your two goalies of the future. You only need two to pan out. If you draft 20 of them but only hit two, you're and, set. And it's important for the Red Wings to have multiple options in terms of their goaltending pipeline. Like, Not only does that alleviate stress on the team because, you know, every single time Kosa falters, you wonder if this is where it goes off the rails. It Just statistically, they're not both going to be, pan out to be NHL starters. You need more uh, darts at the board. And with goalies, it's not so simple as just spend a high pick and get a really well touted player. It's so much is in the development process and things that aren't uncovered until they get even close to making the show. So yeah, it's a fun story of yin and yang, a first and a seventh round pick and all that, but you, you very much just need competitive options. And it also helps your depth too. Like you don't always want to be signing. I don't know, journeymen goaltenders to shore up your, your development or your AHL team and not have anyone who's really viable to come up. Like you want to be developing guys who are going to eventually be part of your team for the future. And it's one last thing, one last thing that you have to focus on or spend more draft capital than you need to in future drafts. Anyhow, credit to Kosa, credit to Guy Lander. It's a kind of a departure from where the Red Wings goaltending prospect world was uh, not too long ago. So, you know, Guy Lander has flown on the radar under the radar, but even just within the scope of this season, I'm happy that Kosa has turned it around and at least quieted a lot of the concerns that were justifiable, but I think a little bit premature for him. Speaking of the draft and highly touted prospects, let's talk about one where it's looking less and less likely that he's going to be there for the Red Wings, depending on where they pick every single day. But one who I think is really, really interesting and could potentially solve a lot of problems for Detroit and at the very least, is a really, really good prospect that's worth chatting about. Uh, no, he did not slap Chris Rock at the Oscars. Yes, he is worth talking Yet. about. Yet. Yeah, that's right. He's worth talking about and uh, is going to be talked about a lot leading up to the NHL draft. Centerman out of the U.S. NTDP, Will Smith. So let's start with the obvious. Will Smith is probably not going to make it to the Wings pick. This is one of those, you know... Best case scenario, every team in front of Detroit just happens to like one prospect better because Will Smith will probably be top two on everybody's board by that point because he is a high-scoring, extremely smart, extremely talented right-handed shooting defenseman who is over 100 points already for the U.S. NTDP this year. Any other draft where you don't have a Carlson, Michkov, Fantilli, and Bedard at the top of it, this guy's probably a top three pick. Um, hey, the benefits of a deep draft. He is everything the Red Wings need, uh, which is disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> Considering where he's likely going in the draft versus where the Red Wings are likely to pick. But what he is as a player is extremely creative and an extremely gifted playmaker. The guys who just process the game at, at a higher level than the players around them. Yep. Um, he's an okay skater. I wouldn't call it like a super strength but it's good um his shot again i wouldn't call it a super strength but it's good but it's his hands and his vision and his processing ability that make him special every time the puck is on his stick there's a threat something could happen and that is there's not a lot of players you can say that about whether that's by transporting the puck 
by getting to the right area to finish a play, but more important, more consistently for him is by setting something up in the offensive zone. And, you know, obviously he's playing with a couple good line mates in the USNTDP, so that really helps get the uh, assist stats up there. But you still have to get them the puck, and he does that more effectively than almost anybody else in this draft. He's also really good at, you know, pulling defenders to him because he is such a threat with the puck, which opens up lanes for his teammates, which clearly is has been proven this season just based on the stat lines. But he's also really good at just floating away and finding the soft spots as well. Um, not a lot of guys that at his age have both of those qualities um, as hockey players. You know, number one center shoots right on the USN TDP, a lot of exposure. I think he just cracked, like you mentioned before we recorded, Brad, 100 points in about 49 games for the USN TDP uh, across all, all competitions. So, yeah, the attention around him is is there and it's justified for the reasons you both said. He's going to create, he's going to maximize his teammates. This is, you're talking about a guy who's going to be, all things go well, a threat on your power play. Uh, in addition to just kind of being a top six center on your team, like if he pans out, that's where he's going to land. And yeah, it's almost unfortunate because that would answer a lot of questions for the Red Wings. He had a quote recently that was, they're talking about what he wants to work on his game. And he said his penalty kill, and you know, GMs are just, when they heard that, they're like, all right, this guy's, if we don't get Bedard, he's moving way up our board. So uh, unless a miracle happens for the Red Wings, I don't imagine Will Smith will be available uh, where they're drafting. You never know how things are going to shake out. And he's actually a guy, this is another question I'm going to keep posing for players who kind of fit the mold of what the Red Wings need. He's a guy that I could see the Red Wings stretching themselves to move a few picks up for. Like, let's say they pick ninth and they don't have any lottery luck, but they do move down the standings to the point where they're ninth and he's available hypothetically at six. I could see this being someone that they make a move for. I mean, right-handed shot, uh, shooting top six centermen aren't going. People aren't going to pass on that too much. They more likely trade back and away from wingers, so to speak. Uh, but it, Will Smith, because he fit, fits that mold so much, like he does a lot of things really, really, really well. He he fits that kind of need of a high hockey IQ. Will create offense. He shoots really well too. I, I don't think that part of his game is you know the part that's going to be labeled across the top of the, the headline for him, but he he also is a really good shooter. Checks all the boxes for Detroit. Checks all the boxes for everyone. Oh, for a lot of teams, of course. We've seen in years past, especially in the top 10, teams place a heavy premium on centers and defense. And this draft sucks for defense. There might not be a single defenseman taken in the top 10 which is going to put that much more premium on centers, which makes it even that much more likely that we'll be sitting here around Independence Day and Will Smith is not a Detroit Red Wing. <laughs> Credit to you. It actually caught me off guard. Uh, but no, genuinely, like this is, uh, with the way everything is kind of poised and, and set up in this draft, yeah, either the Red Wings are in a high enough position somehow where they pick him or they've traded I don't really see his draft stock slipping. He's been a riser this year. Oh, absolutely. Like, my my guess is he's going fifth. Like, I think it's more likely there's a team at four that gets scared of Russians and takes Will Smith ahead of Michkov than I think there's a reality Will Smith slips to the Red Wings at nine. Yeah, like Bedard, Fantilli, Carlson... Someone wants someone who could maybe come a little sooner than Michkov will, or they're, you know, just leery of Russians. And then Will Smith goes four. I think yeah. four is more likely than nine or yeah. 10 for him. Well, the Red Wings have had a lot of exposure to him just by uh, virtue of where he plays. So no doubt that they're going to be very, very familiar with him uh, more so than a lot of other prospects even. So we'll see who knows. He could, he could be a player that's in play for Detroit, but um, as of right now, that's one of those names that's fun to talk about and uh, a lot would have to go Detroit's way for them to even have the opportunity to think about drafting him. And before we move away from Will Smith uh, and his draft prospect profile in the middle of uh, we took a, a break in recording and Evan said his goal song would be really good, which somehow we have to find a way to get, if he's not going to Detroit, get Will Smith to Florida with the Panthers and make his goal song by Miami by Will Smith. That I will tell It must happen. It has to be. 
has to be. It's too easy. Anyhow, uh, let's get into some NHL news here uh, from across the league. A player I want to talk about, Jordan Bennington, goaltender. <laughs> he got a match penalty ejection, two-game suspension, I believe it was. He threw a blocker at um, Ryan Hartman's face. Got tossed from the game, and Bennington's antics, and we'll call them antics, I think that's putting them gently, have been all he's really known for since his miraculous cup run, where he did really well in in St. Louis. It was a lot of that cup run to him, but since then it's just been, oh, Bennington let in six goals and then, you know, flipped off the fans and punched the opposing team in the face on his way out the door or something like that, threatened to, to punch the opposing team in the face. Easily one of the most hated guys in the league right now depending on who you ask, could be more than Brad Marchand. Oh, it has to. If you ask the players, they would hate Bennington more than Marchand because Marchand, A, answers the bell, and B, he knows what he's doing. I don't think Marchand answers the bell as much as he should. No. Well, it's more than zero, which is Jordan Bennington. That's right, yeah. Well, to be fair, (laughs) Bennington tried this time okay very quickly <laughs> oh th- we're gonna just the you know this is a classic bingo card moment let's torch the nhl referees well, like, but, <laughs> but justifiably so as someone who used to referee i have a lot of respect for that position i think it's a thankless job i think you're if you're doing a good job you don't get recognized and if you do a bad job you get absolutely crucified in the public sphere in the public sphere if you were a, a, an nhl referee or a linesman I don't care what internal memo there is to not let goalies fight. Ignore it. I promise the fans will love you forever if you just let them scrap. That's on every highlight. Uh, ESPN might even show that on TV yeah. as part of their morning highlight package. If you let Mark andre Fleury and Jordan Bennington fight, that would have been so good. And we th- that one was for us. They robbed the people of that That's moment. Right. Yeah. It's the people's game. It is. And that was the people's moment. We <laughs> needed that violence and that retribution against <laughs> Jordan Bennington. And it, now we just don't have that. It's Maybe the, sa- the writers are saving it for like the season finale or something. Yeah, you know what? You can never have too many. How many goalie fights do you get a year? One at best? Two, maybe? There's a lot of maybe, threats of them. Yeah. Like, now that Mike Smith's retired, probably none. I know uh, it was it was reported that, uh, you know, no one wants the image of goalies with their helmets off hitting the ice and hitting their heads. And look, that's a very serious thing. Who said thing. that? I think uh, Elliot Friedman mentioned that that's something that he thinks that's why the referees didn't let it go. And I wouldn't be surprised if the league thought that way. But I don't know. If two goalies have their helmets off and they're in the mix and they're throwing blockers and Marc Andre Fleury's taking his gear off and walking down the ice, you know what? They're big boys who made their decision. Just let them go. Yeah, they're they're adults. They know what they signed up for. And if I'm a goalie and I see another goalie throw a blocker at my one of my players, like blockers are like cinder blocks. Oh, like they're a weapon. I'd be skating down there too. And it's, to see that it's Jordan Bennington on potentially the receiving end, I'd be skating even faster. We were robbed. We really were robbed of a glorious moment. And you're both right. You want to sell like it doesn't matter really what you think about fighting in this league if you think it's stupid or not. He'll sell the hell out of that game if you have one of the most famous goalies of his generation and one of the biggest heels in the NHL dropping the gloves in giant Colossus sumo hockey equipment that is known as goalie equipment. Like, it'd be so good. It was literally the most beloved goalie in the NHL about to punch the most hated goalie in the NHL in the face. It was the ultimate, hey, this is going to gain a lot of new fans overnight type (laughs) moment. And the NHL was like, no, no. We are not a fan of fun and games. We are not a fan of growing the sport. We cannot let this happen. Our slow transition into the just punch him in the face, bring some more physicality into the game, boomers, is uh, it's pretty much complete. We are there now, eh? Oh, I've, I've, I've lived there for my entire <laughs> life. You're just welcome to my cave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jordan Bennington is hated. And you know what? If and when he eventually does pull this stuff against the Red Wings and – you know, St. Louis plays Detroit twice here. I will join in the chorus of like, oh man, I want to see, you know, Billy Huso skate down the ice and punch this guy. I actually really like Jordan Bennington for what he brings in terms of entertainment. I think he would be the perfect heel in the NHL. Just that perfect hateable villain, especially because Brad Marchand's one of the only ones, maybe Tom Wilson's the other one that the NHL has otherwise. If he didn't do all of his, like, you know, chirping the fans, getting the fans riled up, punching other teams, 
in the face, like after a, a nothing play, after letting in like seven goals. Like he always does it after he shits the bed in net, which is more often than people would think based on how his you know initial Stanley Cup run went with St. Louis. It's always like choke the game away for the team, let in a soft goal, number seven on the day, and then go throw a blocker at someone. He goes like, scorched earth. Yeah, it's I don't know. It would have been way better if it's like a hateable, uh, hateable player, but who at least puts up the numbers. So you, it makes you mad that you have to respect how. Good hey, that's he is. on him. If He's, that's on him to be better, Tom Wilson. Yeah, you hate the guy. Rangers fans would absolutely loathe the guy. He produces. He makes a difference on his team. You can't deny his offensive ability. Brad Marchand literally licked a man twice. <laughs> twice. <laughs> two, two men. A, during in a sporting event, which is disgusting. Licked his face. Well, premeditated. And puts up 100 points. Yeah. Jordan Bennington doesn't do those things. And that's, to me, that that's where Yet. it falters. They, well, no, sorry. I'm at the 100-point equivalent for goalies. The oh, he, someone he in the lets face. in hundreds of goals. Yeah. <laughs> he's probably contributing to Brad Marchand's point totals. But entertainment value, he uh, fills his diaper, and lots of goals are scored while he's out there. It's peak. Value. That's that's my message to Jordan Bennington. Hey, fill your diaper, make your statement. You know, compare yourself to uh, Goodwill Hunting all you want, you weirdo. Excuse me. Yeah, he. <laughs> yeah, hold on, I missed this too. <laughs> <laughs> We're in really his, going what? off the rails now. No, no. In his Department of Player Safety uh, meeting, where he ended up getting suspended, he compared being in that meeting and having to defend himself to that scene uh, in Goodwill Hunting. <laughs> this is like, guy is the worst. This is like in high school, and they're like, you know how you should always start an essay with a famous quote? <laughs> this is kind of what he just did. Webster's Dictionary defines. Defines insanity as. <laughs> yeah, no, do that all you want, but just make the save. And I'm sure Blues fans think the same thing. Because I, I think even the coach... In St. Louis, like Craig Berube in St. Louis said, like, yeah, I, I, you know, asked him to rein it in, like, focus on stopping the puck first. Yeah. Anyways. I love it. As from an entertainment perspective, this is amazing. Oh, totally. But we could have had more entertainment if it weren't for the refs. Well, they got two games against the Red Wings soon. And Ryan, remind me quickly, how tall is Magnus Helberg? Uh, what, 6'6", six, six, is he? Cool. Start him both games. Magnus Helberg is... Yeah, six six. Yeah. You should start in him warm ups, not even take the net, just stand at center ice staring at Jordan Binning. That would set him off. He wouldn't even make it to the to puck drop. No. He'd skate down the ice during the national anthem. If Helberg does that, give him a two year contract extension immediately. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say build a statue, but you know. Yeah. Uh some other news. Actually, someone, another prospect that I want to bring attention to uh is Amadeus Lombardi. See? Yeah, he's good. He has been having, he's nearing on 100 points with the Flint Firebirds in the OHL. 43 goals, 54 assists. In terms of points, he is currently third in the OHL. Assists, he ranks uh, ninth. And goals, he is sitting at sixth. He's nearing on, he has 97 points in 66 games. Full credit to that guy. He's setting records with the Firebirds. He is having a phenomenal season, and for a fourth-round pick, Detroit could not have asked for more. Wasn't he a super late bloomer, too? This well, is his second OHL season. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> As a 19-year-old. He didn't play uh, either of his 16- uh, or 17-year-old seasons in the OHL. One that is ridiculous, by the way. Yeah, the one because he didn't make the team, and the second year because of COVID, mm -hmm. so... The Red Wings drafted him as an overager after his 18-year-old year in the OHL. And, yeah, so this is his second season in the OHL. That o is outrageous. Yeah, the Red Wings could not have asked for a, a better result here. And even at the time of drafting, I remember you mentioning, Brad, you know, that the way the COVID year messed up his development, and this could be a diamond in the rough. He showed well in 21-22, 59 points in 67 games played, but he has really, really turned it up for the Firebirds. So, I know we bring him up from time to time and probably not enough. No, no. He's going to make some noise in Detroit's uh, prospect program. Well, this is the exact type of pick we talked about coming out of COVID. The There are going to be guys who have weird development paths. There are guys who are going to be late bloomers because they didn't get to play. There are going to be a lot of under scouted players because of all that circumstance. So there is going to be a run of, like we said, about two draft groups here where you're going to find guys like this in the late rounds just because of the shitty circumstance they had to deal with. And 
you know, it's it's still way too early to claim any victories, but it sure as hell looks like Detroit found one of those. And it like these things, these stories are starting to crop up a little bit more. Like if Guylander turns out, that's one. Lombardi turns out, that's one. And not all of these are like fourth or seventh round picks, but like you think about Wallinder, even like the second, third, fourth round guys, those all matter too. So yeah, that's, you look at Eiserman's success in Tampa Bay. I know Braden Point is the one people point to the most, but the depth players and the players that made a difference in their organizations that came outside of that first round pick, that's how you really kind of solidify. You need to nail those first round picks too, but yeah, to to really round out your prospect pool, like you said, Brad, these are the kinds of things you need to have happen. So yeah, Lombardi is, is showing well. All right, uh, let's get into overtime here. Overtime is brought to you by our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. If you want to support the show and join the so-called dub dub club, you get access in to our winged wheel podcast official discord you get entered into all of our giveaways uh most notably we're giving away two tickets to every detroit red wings home game this season and the vast majority of them have gone to patreon supporters and you get access to our uh patreon exclusive overtime bonus episodes which record right after these main ones uh we do everything on the show based on our support from patrons it's the heart and soul of this show so uh we really really can't say thank you enough to our patrons so patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast if you want to join in that support all right uh first question here we'll take from bumblebee tuna it says what move has been the most important for the future of the team hiring Lalone, extending larkin or trading Hronik? <sighs> The problem is we don't really have definitive answers on any of that because Lalone's only had one year, Larkin's extension, he hasn't even started playing on that contract, and we don't know who we picked with the Heronic things. I'm going to go with the safest answer here, which is extending Larkin. That was going to be mine too. I think it is extending Larkin. There's a, a shot here that, you know, depending on who they pick from what they get out of the Heronic deal, that changes things. But for now, you sign your number one center your captain, your you know best player this season, long term, uh, that's going to be the most. It's going to make the biggest impact. Uh, Mike Caviani says Stutzla goes number one in a redraft. Right, looks like he's been having a big sophomore season while many of those picked around him are having a bit of mixed results. Speaking of thoughts on where Razor is at this point, speaking to be or seemed to be picking it up after a slow start, then got injured and hasn't quite found his groove since returning. Not that he's been bad. Yeah, Stutzla definitely goes one in a redraft. Uh definitively Raymond probably still goes number two. Um, so not a lot to be disappointed in there. Yeah, it, it happens. Raymond is now suffering from a lot of what he suffered through towards the end of last season, where the Red Wings, uh, offensive producers are really thin. So teams, it, it's really easy for teams to isolate on him and Larkin right now. And, you know, coming back from the injury, he's fighting through it again. So the circumstances around Raymond's season have not been ideal. And, you know, he's still playing well. Um, but, yeah, he this guy really needs a consistent full year and not from himself, from the team around him. Yeah, I'll say not a lot of it. Like some of it is, has to be tempering expectations. Some of it has to be the dynamics of the league, the opposition changing around, around him and his team, his line mates changing. Uh, I will say some of it is on him, though. Like, these are the tough parts of your development, and I have no doubts based on what we've seen so far that he will continue his progress into being a star. But he's going through the tough patches right now where it's becoming tougher to play in the NHL. Um, the good news is he's at the right age and time in his development. Like He's not behind by any means. He's ahead of his peers. Uh, but he still has to put in the work to kind of figure out how to adapt to the game and not just, you know, adapt, play a certain way and regress maybe to old play styles or adapt and then let the, the opponents catch up. You have to be dynamic in terms of how you approach the game. And he's smart enough to do that. He has a hockey IQ to to, to be that way. Uh, Chris Gatchel says, do you think McIsaac and Sabrango will get a shot next year? They're both better than Hag and Lindstrom, in my opinion. Um, Probably not. No? If, if we're talking... What defensemen are going to get the call outside of the Red Wings right now? Are they even in the top three? They're not even, definitively not in the top two. Edmondson and Johansson are going first. So unless there's a rash of injuries or one of Edmondson and Johansson really regresses next year, are they going to play three rookie defensemen? Um, 
not three, then something has to go wrong with Edvinson and Johansson for that to happen, I think. I could see Johansson spending more time in Grand Rapids. I could see them cycling in and out as like, you know, I understand wanting veteran depth, and I'm sure they'll have some of that in terms of uh, their seventh defenseman next season. But at some point, you're going to have to make a decision on those guys. And are they good enough to come in and be, you know, a little bit of a, a play 10 games up here, five games down in Grand Rapids kind of guy? Do you give them a shot to see if they can stick solidly on the third pair all season? Maybe not next year, but you know, injuries change things, trades change things, signings change things. I, they're not at the top of the chart. You're right, but I could see them getting a look at some point as a, a on a secondary basis. Yeah, they're not even top two guys in terms of call ups on Grand Rapids because of Edvinson Johansson, and we still don't know what's going on with Wallander next year. Is he still in the SHL? Maybe he comes over to Grand Rapids and. I mean, they're probably both behind him right away. And don't get me wrong, I've liked Sabrango and McIsaac's progression relative uh, to McIsaac's injuries and where Sabrango was drafted. Um, they've been really good stories, but they are huge long shots to be NHL regulars just with how loaded the Red Wings system is. And that doesn't even count guys who haven't worked out of junior at the NCAA yet because, you know, don't forget Shy Boom was still a high second round pick and. God knows when he leaves Denver where he'll slot in relative to everybody else. Yeah. Uh, okay. Patrick J says, other than Elmer Soderblom, uh, what fifth to seventh round pick do you think has the best chance to play NHL games drafted here by Steve Eisenman? To help out, that's Cooper Moore, Gustav Berglund, uh, Kirill Tataev, Carter Guylander, Keenan Draper, Kyle O'Coin, Alex Cotton, Liam Dover, Dover Nielsen, Oscar Plandowski, Haskali Zito, Tanaya smith Owen Mellenbacher and Brendan Ollie. The only one at this point that's shown there's even a chance is Guy Lander. I think Dover Nielsen. He's been good in the Allsvin Scon. Uh, Tutayev was, was really good in the ECHL. They are still extreme long shots, as good as they've been. Steven Albliss says, I like Berggren so far. Do you guys see him as a future star? Defined star. Uh, point per game, no. Yeah, I see him as better. Is it fair to say could be a slightly better Gustav Nyquist in terms of where he kind of played in the lineup and impact? If we're talking role and impact, Nyquist probably feels like best case scenario, like peak Nyquist. Yeah, and that's good. And that's really good, mm-hmm. for, especially for a second round pick. But it, like again, I think that's best case scenario. I don't, I don't see... Berggren being an 82-point guy. Uh, noted Phillips Adina whisperer Ben Barron says, Hey guys, I know you've talked about this before, uh, but why is there such a stigma around left-handed D-men playing on the right, and why is it so seemingly difficult for most lefties to play on the right? Seems like there's a strong lack of belief that both Johansson and Willinder can't play the right in the NHL despite playing major minutes in the AHL and SHL respectively. I was never able to skate as a kid, so I never learned major hockey strategy. Thanks for all the help and keep up the great work. There's a lot of reasons for it, but I'll give two very specific examples where it gets extremely difficult to play on your offside. Most teams run a breakout where you're not just firing the puck straight up the board. So if you are a left-handed defenseman coming up the right side, you are either looking, you are looking to make a pass somewhere to the middle of the ice, wherever that is. Now you either have to make that pass on your backhand, which is extremely difficult. Okay, remember, the hardest shot for a goalie to save is a backhand because the goalie doesn't know where it's going and the player doesn't know where it's going. So if you're trying to hit a tape-to-tape pass on the backhand, especially if it's cross-ice or any distance, good luck. Coaches will crucify you if you attempt a full cross-ice pass on your backhand, which means then you need to open up your body to make that pass on the forehand. So if there is any kind of pressure, the way you have to pivot your body to open yourself up there Mm -hmm. makes you a prime target to get sent to the moon. Because when you are in that opened up position, you have lost your agility. You are not going to be able to make that pass and then step around the guy. So you can really only make that play effectively quickly from your back end or if you have time. Now, there are ways you can use your feet and you can use your brain to create that time. That's why there's a lot of guys who can do it. Like, you know, TJ Brody does it all the time in Toronto. It is very doable, but you have to work around this. The other example offensive blue line how many times have we seen on the power play in an offensive cycle you just rim the puck around the boards Mm -hmm. 
Now you have to pick. It's hard enough to pick up a puck around the rim of the uh, boards because, A, that ice is generally pretty chewed up. And, B, you're going to be under pressure. Now you have to take that on your backhand or with your foot. And 9 out of 10 times when you are in that spot making that play, you are going to be under pressure. So now having to make that play off your backhand or your foot slows you down that much more and makes it a very difficult play. Again, doable, but the difficulty factor goes up 100%. There's a, I remember a practice I played, or I was in once where uh, they were trying me out on the left side. We had a new kid on the team. They wanted me paired with him. We both were on the right. They said, all right, Ryan, just try the left. So we were practicing that way. And uh, we had a guy on our team. I loved playing with him, but he would punish you whether you were the opposing team or he were his teammate in practice. He would hit you every opportunity he got. That was just the the price of having like a human wrecking ball in your team. And I was picking the puck up off the left side boards. They, um, they The puck was ringed around the boards. And I didn't really protect my body because I wanted to really cleanly pick up the puck because I wanted to make a quick move to make a pass. And so... I was facing the boards like it was a bad move and he absolutely demolished me from behind into those boards and my neck was not right for like weeks after that. And I just remember thinking like, obviously you scrum after that and whatever is practice, you go back to the room and he got yelled at and uh, I remember him saying, well, then he shouldn't have left himself exposed like that because I'm not the only one who would hit him like that. Someone else on the opposing team would too and he's going to get hurt even worse because they won't let up. And I was like, I'm pissed off, but the guy has a point. Like it's... Obviously, NHL players, that's a little different. They know how to protect themselves better than minor league players. But if you're asking why even at different levels this doesn't happen, like it, it, pro, it poses a lot of like physically in space. Like It doesn't matter how good you are. It's going to take more time, and it's going to, you're going to have to sacrifice either protecting your body or making the right play with the puck, no matter what, to some degree. That said, all of this said, there are players who can do it. There are players who are good enough where they can do it. And they will exist, and their advantages on you know, cutting down the time to make a pass or one time or whatever, it will make it worth it, but it's very sparing. All right, time for some uh, Reddit questions. Actually, let's take one more um, Patreon question. This one from, I believe the name is Blind Notice, says, why is the officiating uh, seeming to be turning a regressive corner in the NHL? I've noticed not just the wings, but across the league that calls are being missed on blatant plays or calls are not being made, often with a clear line of sight. Are standards dropping or is the game just becoming too quick? Standards are dropping. I have no other explanation for it. Now, don't get me wrong. It's always been bad. What's happening this year isn't all that dissimilar to what's been happening for the last 15 years. But it does seem to be a little more prevalent this year, and I don't have an explanation as to why. It always works out this way because if you remember 0506, hey, we got to crack down on everything and there were a million power plays. And then three years later, that wasn't the case anymore. So the the refing leniency always goes in cycles, gets worse and worse and worse. Referendum on it gets better, then slowly gets worse and worse and worse. Another referendum gets better. It is what it is. You know, some people want less calls, not more. Some people want more, not less. You're never going to have a perfect consensus but the referendum on uh, what NHL refs should be doing probably needs to come up again because it, it's getting a little I don't want to call it bad because I feel like a lot of this is the refs are just following what they're told but it's becoming a little too obvious I'll disagree I'll say it's more that the game is becoming faster because I think that the yo-yo the pendulum swing of or I don't know what to call it maybe an elastic band where you tighten up because yeah You focus on something, and we see that sometimes with CBA resets or rule resets. But I think the game is just becoming really fast, and it's hard. Oh. (laughs) Oh, it's too fast. It's hard. Okay. It's not to say— Then don't do it. I don't think anyone could at the standard that was maybe more reliable in in decades past. I think the game is too quick, and I think you need to start looking to more automated— More reviews. Got it. No, no. Not more reviews. More automated solutions in— concert like in partnership with the human element on the ice chat gtp or whatever it's called yeah we'll use that yeah say it again no <laughs> <laughs> add it to the list you gotta pay <laughs> more you heard it more reviews ryan Hanna. no 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 not more reviews just more robots dictating the way we live our lives i for one submit to our offside algorithm overlords 
At this least is a Will Smith episode. So I'm going to slap you. This is, yeah, this is where we could have made the iRobot joke. Yeah. Uh, ah. Yeah. I would really enjoy watching an NHL game from the start of my workday all the way to the end. <laughs> a matinee just turns into an evening game by the end of it. That's right. Why no. not? It's it's harder in hockey than most other sports. It's not ten- tennis where the Skyhawk technology can change things. I genuinely think it'll be hockey will be one of the last sports to have it done, but it's doable. And I think rather than saying the only options are a five minute review or trusting every goal based on a judgment decision that's happening quicker and quicker every day for it and eyeballs aren't getting any better, give the folks on the ice something automated that sees everything and that can spit out a decision in mere milliseconds. That's what I say. We're going to need like an after earth type scenario before we get rid of, I'm going to punch before we get rid of reviews. Aren't we? I was actually, this is only going to get worse. I was going to say after earth is the one that there's no way you were going to fit in there. Yep. An apocalyptic type scenario is how we're getting rid of reviews. Isn't it? Reddit questions. Uh, Let's kill time says, Hey guys, the latter part of the season has exposed the team even more to how bad their skating has been slow at zone entries, especially during the power play or even trying to break a cycle in the D zone. What are your thoughts on emphasizing the skating aspect for both the pipeline and some of the current roster? Also, for off-season assignments, Cider and Raymond should strengthen their shooting skills, like Jason Robertson and Tage Thompson did last season. What are your thoughts? I agree with the Raymond and Cider thing. More shooting threats, threats on a team that can't shoot isn't a bad idea. And yeah, putting an emphasis on skating on a team that doesn't skate particularly well also seems like a really good idea. But there are players in the pipeline who should help with that. Like Marco Casper is a, a very, very good skater. So, you know, they, they, they seem to have started to address that. And though he's not quick, Simon Evanson's a very gifted skater, uh, especially uh, on his edges and laterally. So it's getting better, but yes, it is a major problem with the current roster. They also traded Tyler Bertuzzi. So it did get better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's addition by subtraction in the skating department there. Yeah. Yeah. I, you see sometimes they come out with a game plan where they're like going to skate really hard and, and bring it to these guys, and it actually makes a difference. You're like, oh, my God, that's one of the best periods of hockey that they've played, but it falls off very quickly because they're just not really a strong. Like they're, they're not built to do that for 60 minutes. Uh, Red Wings fan 1990 says, what do you think is our biggest need during the offseason? Elite talent. Uh, first line, second line, center, a uh, center, high-end center. Right D. It's a weird way of saying top six center. Yeah, I think one of them is more attainable, though. And there are oh, even... what's more realistic? Yes, you are correct. But what's the biggest need? Top six center, and it will forever be until we get one. Uh, this one who that just came in from Leafs Suck sixty nine, great name, says, uh, "Am I the only one that thinks Mazer should get some NHL games in by the end of the year after the college tourney?" That. Is tricky because he once he plays NHL games, he can't go back to college next year. So I would be for it again, just to give a guy, you know, a taste of what the NHL is like. But they have to be pretty committed then at that point for him to go pro next year because there is no turning back. So if they think another year in the NCAA is better for his development, they can't do it. But if he wants to go pro, yeah, get him into some games with Detroit or Grand Rapids this year. I don't think either really matters which one, but. Yeah, get him going. All right. We're going to wrap up this episode. We're going to be back with you on Wednesday. Again, if you uh, bought tickets to Winged Wheel Podcast Day at the LCA, stay tuned. Uh, keep your uh, an eye on your email or wingedwheelpodcast.com slash blog or Twitter uh, at Winged Wheel Pod. Give us a follow. Uh, more details to come. We'd like to thank all of our listeners, our name levels, or and our listeners new and old, all of you who have uh, joined Patreon. We really, really appreciate it. Our name level supporters on Patreon. Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Gran Foundation, Akefer, Bertuzzi is straight up missing, Nick Perks, Icon, uh, Lassie, Emil, Lind Anderson, who's a brand new name level sponsor. Uh, we are G Long, the greatest team of all. Glenn Brabham, Yuki Nitorp, Aiden White, Jordan Bernaski, Keenan O'Donohue, Yanni Burgers, Meals on Wheels, Matthew M. Rice, Croner's Left Knee, Babe Landeskog, Bert Baconator, Brutus Killed Caesar on the Ides of March, Dummy Dummies. Yeah. Oh, I think he's saying that to you guys. Carl Bertin and Aluski, Chimmy, Chris P, Citizen High Five, Connor Scovey, Coyote Season Tickets and Tempe, Denny's Gamer Girl, Derek Enstam, Detroit Rob, DJ Denton, Give Blood Fight Probert, 
Hassam al Qasem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joel Miranda, Joseph Berry, Kalen Wood, Kevin James, King Tone, Las Ensaladas Picantes, Marcus, Massive Wong, Evan Longsaber, Matt McKay, Michael Edland, Nicholas Fritz, Oliver Klozoff. Oh. <laughs> oh. I'm an idiot. R.A. Uh, Red. H.R. Red T. Red. I don't know. Red 3. Uh, brand new name level sponsor. So welcome. And sorry, I'm not reading your name right. Scott Martin, send it Seawolf. That's what I appreciate about you. Wallman's Elite Dancing D. General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army. Sam Bankson, number one Rob the Big Hog Hag and the Detroit Red Guys fan. A.A. Ron, Adam Gowitska, Adam Rose, Antonio Gracias, Brad Simmons, Brian Vasha, C.J. Wilkinson, Connor Leighton, Corey Prida, Darren Fick, Flo T-Cast, Forever and Always, Bertuzzi's Lost Tooth, Frank Stanley, Georgia's Biggest Fan, Grand Rapids Hockey Guy, Griffey Boy, James Laporte, Jeremiah Adobo, J.M. Rhapsody, John Evans, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Lieutenant Matt S. of the Cheesebag Army, Linda Hull, Marco Casper, Matt Keeler, Maximilian, Melissa Erickson, Norris Sider, Noted Philip Zadina Whisperer, Ben Barron, Ophelia, Reed, Stephen, Tatarsas, and The Hodag. Thank you all so very much, and we will be back with you on Wednesday. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.